right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a good lineup today. A lot of our uh, home and visiting medical students are presenting. So I'll just pre I'll, I'll introduce a couple of the presenters at a time, and then we'll we'll go from there. So our first presenter is going to be uh, Judd Cahoon, who is currently a fourth year medical student at the University of Utah. Judd and I go way back. We were students together as undergrads, as medical students. Actually, before that, even he taught my brother guitar. And so <laughs> that's another thing about Judd. If you don't know, he's a fantastic guitar player and teaches many prolific students. He doesn't help that. <laughs> Great question, and I'm glad you brought that up. Judd pursued a PhD in neuroscience, neuroscience, and he's now back finishing the MD portion of the MD PhD. So we'll be happy to hear from him. Oh, sorry. And then I'll also introduce uh, Rebecca Gensher, who is a fourth year student who is uh, at Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. And she has also earned a PhD in biomedical engineering. And she'll be talking to us about transcorneal electrical stimulation today. So we'll go from there. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for inviting me to uh, give this little talk. Um, I, I gave a grand rounds a couple years ago. And I guess I can kind of update kind of where the progress happened since then. I'll be talking about Compang1 and uh, a therapy that we're trying to use in diabetic retinopathy. So just kind of an overview of the talk. We'll discuss um, an intro to diabetic retinopathy, some of the methods we use to probe this, and then um, I'll focus just on a small segment of results regarding vascular inflammation. Uh, basically, I just chose the results that I thought looked really cool and had kind of cool videos to see physiology in action so that we could uh, enjoy that. Um, then we'll wrap up from there. Great, so diabetic retinopathy. My understanding of diabetic retinopathy uh, is that A, it's a big problem. Uh, it's the leading cause of blindness in the working age population. Uh, it's 93 million people worldwide. That's a good chunk of folks. Uh, it costs a lot to treat, very expensive to treat. Um, but there's also some indirect costs because this is happening to the working age population. So there's lost productivity, there's absenteeism um, with people having visual disturbances because of the diabetes. 35% uh, of people, so over a third of people in the population experience uh, diabetic retinopathy, and 80% of people with diabetic retinopathy don't even know they have it, as uh, they can remain asymptomatic for a while despite the pathophysiology going on. Uh, those numbers are expected to triple by 2030. So I try to conceptualize how this works and what's going on uh, in relatively simple terms, and I just think of hyperglycemia inducing neurovascular damage. How is it inducing neurovascular damage? That's through some of the classical pathways of Increased reactive oxygen species, some cells are very sensitive to that. Advanced glycation end products, PPC pathway, and the polyol pathway with sorbitol and increased osmotic. So what do I mean by neurovascular damage? I mean uh, vascular permeability and edema, the blood vessels become leaky. We'll take a look at some of that. There's capillary degeneration and non-perfusion where actual endothelial cells um, are gone and the only thing left is uh, an empty basement membrane through which no blood or oxygen or nutrients and uh, as you can imagine, that could lead to some neuroglial dysfunction and degeneration. So what's the problem then? The problem is that the current treatments are reactive. When I think about a, uh, a, a retina that is undergoing vascular damage and vascular compromise, such as it happens in diabetic retinopathy, I picture the retina screaming you know, that it needs to be fed. And, and what it screams is VEGF. And so some of our treatments for that are to just eliminate the screaming cells um, with uh, PRP, and you can see we're just eliminating those cells that are telling us something bad is going on and ignoring the underlying problem. Uh, secondarily, we could just eliminate the message that they're screaming, which happens to be VEGF. And ultimately, we know that the uh, best treatment for this would be to prevent the hyperglycemia causing that. Um, and so we're, when I, uh, to con further conceptualize what's happening to the endothelial cells, here's a capillary. Uh, we've got endothelial cells here in pink, pericytes, which cells for the endothelial cells, um, diagrammed in yellow. And the retina is special because it's got this increased uh, ratio, um, the highest ratio in the body of parasites to endothelial cells, a one-to-one -one ratio at some parts. And the parasites are responsible for providing structural and trophic support. And one important um, signal that they send is angiopoietin-1. That's the tyrosine receptor. Ty2 is a tyrosine kinase receptor, um, which is kind of a secondary vascular maturation signal that comes after VEGF, where VEGF could induce neovascularization or angiogenesis. 
and, uh, ang1 through the TI2 receptor induces vascular maturation. It prevents the vessels from leaking and it helps them become more stable. And that's in part through this vascular endothelial calcium adhesion molecule, VECAD here. And, and this is about the only thing I want you to remember from the talk is, is angiopoietin-1 signaling through the TI2 receptor, the signaling molecules we can leave for another day. In a hyperglycemic state, you uh, lose pericytes and their trophic signaling support. Angiopoietin-1 levels decrease. There's decreased signaling through the TI2 receptor. Therefore, those um, adherins molecules, VE cadherins, they become internalized and you have increased hyperpermeability. Additionally, diabetes leads to an inflammatory state in the retina where the VEGF levels and TNF alpha levels are increased, leading to adhesion of these, um, my representation of leukocytes sticking on to integrins and ICAM1s. And uh, eventually down the road, you get capillary degeneration itself uh, with resulting poor perfusion and increased VEGF secretion. We hypothesize that if we had a model with persistent hyperglycemia um, and we restored signaling through the TI2 receptor, we could prevent uh, the pathophysiologic sequelae of diabetic retinopathy. So how did we study that? Briefly, I'll go over the methods here. We used a mirroring model of, di of diabetic retinopathy. This is the Akita mouse, which has a point mutation in the insulin gene, so it's a type diabetic model. It doesn't secrete insulin. Results in hyperglycemia. Uh, it mimics the early pathophysiologic uh, presentation of diabetic retinopathy, including um, capillary loss, increased retinal hyperpermeability, and uh, ganglion cell loss. CompAng1 is a modified version of angiopoietin-1. So the angiopoietin described earlier, secreted by the parasites and acting on the TI2 receptor, is a fairly long protein. And when it's been tried to use uh, that specific protein in therapeutic applications before, this coil-coil domain results in hyper um, conglomeration fo forming multimers that fall out of solution and aren't therapeutically reliable. Uh, some collaborators of ours developed this COMPANG1, which stands for cartilage, cartilage oligomatrix protein, basically replacing this portion of the uh, protein which caused clumping and aggregation and falling out of solution with uh, a portion that makes it much more soluble and, and actually much more potent while leaving the, the portion, the domain that interacts with the TI2 receptor. So this is the drug that we were using. And our delivery mechanism of this was to take the codes for that protein and uh, put it in a, a plasmid and use an adeno-associated virus, serotype 2. The reason we decided to use this one is that we felt it was very translationally relevant as uh, multiple clinical trials um, have used AAV2 uh, for retinal purposes um, with an intravitreal or subretinal injection. So the setup of the experiments went something like this. We took mice and we had four groups of mice. We had a non-diabetic mouse and then um, two control diabetic mice treated with either a sham injection or a sham virus that expressed GFP so we could light up the retina and see where it was being expressed. And then finally, our control group. So these are the four different kind of representations I'll show you here. And the important thing to remember is with these mice, we treated them with a single intravitreal injection, not repeat injections, not a systemic injection, but one intravitreal injection of this AAV2 construct, and then monitored them over the course of four months. And the end of our experiments took place when the mice were six months old. And today, I'll focus on the inflammatory cycle of leukocyte adhesion and, and some extravasation. All right. So in terms of um, results from this, what we were looking for, I'll focus in on the vascular results. And specifically, we'll talk about the vascular function in terms of inflammation. So what we're looking at here is an in vitro experiment where we have an endothelial monolayer where we tried to make a blood vessel um, on a dish, basically. And here, we've got a bird's eye view of some endothelial cells back down here. And then these little white dots represent leukocytes rolled the leukocytes under a constant pressure and a regular density from the top to the bottom. And we'll take a look at that one more time. And these leukocytes are rolling, they're flowing from the top to the bottom, and you know, not much is happening. This is a control situation. When we add one of these inflammatory cytokines to the endothelial cells, you can see these leukocytes grab a hold, stick, and roll. And there's much more adhesion going on in this inflammatory state. When we add COMPANG1 plus that inflammatory cytokine, the adhesion in the rolling is greatly reduced. That's all well and good for our blood vessels that we 
mock created in a dish. How does this work in vivo? So we took, um, oh, we quantified that and found it significant. So we quantified that with acridine orange leukocyte fluorography. And what we do here is we label leukocytes with um, acridine orange. And just give us the best view possible. And using a Heidelberg spectralis, we anesthetize the mice and plop them up there. And we can watch the leukocytes as they travel up the artery, through the capillaries, and then back down the veins. And we can track these and measure them and look at the <coughs> flow time, the response time, and uh, how well they're flowing. So here's our control animal, and you'll see a, a wash of white blood cells come up this arterial, cross through this capillary here. We can go back and take a look one more time. And here is an inflammatory response. This is a diabetic mouse. Here's two veins coming back into the central portion here. And I'll play this video one more time so that we can see leukocytes rolling as they come through here, adhering, much slower transit times. You can see them plugged up at these bifurcations pretty well. Here's our other control mouse. This is a GFP mouse. You can see the GFP staining of the retinal ganglion cells and their axons, and they had increased rolling as well. And finally, with our Compang-1 treated mice, um, the, the leukocytes were flowing much more cleanly through the arterioles, the capillaries, and then back down through the, uh, the veins. <coughs> we were able to quantify this, um, showing that the that Compang-1 normalized the, the velocity as well as decreased the rolling in our diabetic mice. So that's just a snippet. I think my time is about up. And the take home point would be that Compang-1 can prevent leukocyte adhesion and an inflammatory response as well as extravasation um, despite persistent hypoglycemia. Um, again, lots of people helped out with this project, and this is just a small slice of it. I'd like to acknowledge them. And, uh, I'll thank you, and I'll take any questions at this point. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Olson. Fascinating work. Uh, and to make it even more germane, sadly, with the incidence of diabetic complications and diabetes going like this, and with macular degeneration uh, improvement in the visual uh, quality due to our VEGF inhibitors, there are many people who think diabetic retinopathy is now the leading cause of blindness in this case. Hmm. If not, everybody agrees within one to two years of working. Yeah, yeah, it's so only anything increasing. Breaks already profound, profound changes in up and down regulation of vascular homeostatic mechanisms that are way out of whack. So this is something that happens early on. And uh, eventually, I think they come up with biomarkers that are telling us, you know, it's, it's going to be much more than, you know, A1Cs that are saying, ooh, this person is, is if we don't change this, they, they are, they are going to get into trouble eventually. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of you silent start, things that are reading, happening. Start treating them. Definitely. Thank you. Any other? Uh, so um, Doug talked about two of the strands. One, the, um, the source of the case that starts early and also um, sort of uh, the compound strand. Is it effective for any of uh, the strands to be used or most of what is on the video is happening on all of that research and confidentiality and the computer work? Wow. Congratulations. That's very good. Thanks. Please stand. We've got Chris Conrad.